This is Kan Zen Shu, the podcast, episode 349 for the week of December 1st, 2013. What up, AOs? Hey, welcome to Kan Zen Shu. Oh, the podcast. That's right, an extension of the all encompassing Dragon Ball fan site. Dizen, oh, uh, sorry, Kan Zen Shu. Uh, you screwed me up. Uh, we cover anything and everything Dragon Ball in Hope 7 Lightning and a little bit. Oh, the entertaining. Sup, sup. My name is Mike Vegito EX joining me two weeks in a row. So excited. We got the Herms over there. What up, Jake? I ate too much pizza. Uh, too much pizza? <laughs> Is that the post-Thanksgiving uh, food of choice? But, yeah, that's what we have for Thanksgiving in Missouri. It's just pizza. Just pizza. All the time. For days. Days on end. Pretty much. We did pizza after Thanksgiving, too, so that's not too weird. So how you doing, man? It's been uh, a week. This is uh, this is amazing. Yeah, it's pretty much to the day. Yeah, I, I love having you on the show. We can you, you come prepared with topic ideas and outlines and... Um, so it's been a pretty slow week, and if you've been looking at content, you looking for uh, news, there's literally no posts since the last podcast episode. Uh, we have content coming to the site. Just a lot of that near 99% done kind of stuff that needs finalization. It's been holidays, and we've been taking some time away from the site, so hopefully you can understand that. But uh, When was the last time there was this little news in a week? Ah, oh, it's, I want to say years. <laughs> <laughs> like 2003 or so. Right, right. Between GT and Kai, like that time period, somewhere around there. Uh, Yeah, but it's been nice. I mean, I think there have been a couple little news stories, but we'll catch up on them. Nothing too significant. So uh, in lieu of news, we are uh, topic only, topic heavy yet again. I like this, though, because we can keep going back to Battle of Gods. It's like this never ending well of topics and information and analysis we can do. Jake, you uh, you approached me with topic ideas, which I am thankful for. What is the one we are doing today? Yes, well, I cornered you in a dark alley and suggested several topic ideas, right. and we kind of settled on this one. So last week, we went over the JSAT special for its five-year anniversary, and one thing we mentioned several times is that uh, compared to Battle of Gods, the JSAT special didn't really add much to the Dragon Ball universe. I mean, it's got uh, Vegeta having a younger brother, but that's about it. Yeah, that's it. So we thought we'd go and dive into the various things which uh, Battle of Gods has added to the universe. Because it right. has uh, thrown a couple things into the mix there. You know, thinking back to the JSAT special, maybe this, I don't want to say maybe, it definitely it ties in with Dragon Ball Online, uh, just randomly popping into my head here. Uh, the remnants of Frieza's army. That was something that was kind of tossed out, that there's still some beings out there still loyal to the, the idea, the mission of uh, Lord Frieza there, I suppose. Yeah, well, it's kind of a contrast. In uh, Dragon Ball Online, the remnants of his army are trying to avenge his death. Mm. But in the JSAT special, like Abo and Kato, they're just trying to take his place, more or less. Right, right. Sort of like a callback to Dragon Ball Z movie 3, where we have Teles, his, his minions are like... I, I mean, there's that toss away line about Frieza and it's just, oh, we'll be stronger than him now, whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's why they're eating the fruit is so they can get strong enough to beat him. I mean, even after uh, Cell and Boo, it's kind of interesting how things still come back to Frieza all in the end. So uh, that's our topic this week. Battle Yay. of Gods <laughs> came out in theaters in Japan back in March. Uh, and we just got the Japanese home release back in September. The first international home release was the Hong Kong release that is out that does have official English subtitles on it. Uh, I'm still waiting for my copy to come in. So I'm still kind of going off the random screenshots that are out there. Uh, I'd like to do my own comparison of what that translation is is at some point. Uh, so there are options to watch Battle O Gods. Uh, for a while there, we kind of covered it and we let it go away for a little bit because it didn't have a home release. Uh, now that there is a home release, we're kind of going to it's up for grabs <laughs> when there's something cool to talk about with Battle of Gods and especially if Jake has something uh, good to toss into the mix we will do it so that's the plan this episode uh, I, I got nothing else on tap so uh, just get into the topic okay Jake, Battle of Gods, it kind of started adding to the universe long before the movie came out. Uh, I want to say one of the first new additions we got was kind of this idea of creation and destruction, right? Yeah, so, I mean, the, with the title right off the bat, it's Battle of Gods. So we knew that gods were going to play a heavy role in the movie. And then the first trailer and some of the other very early information that leaked out specified that the villain of this movie would 
B, the god of destruction. And then later on, uh, we got some more clarification that there was both gods of destruction and gods of creation, and that both are needed to maintain the balance. And this is what uh, Kaio slash the narrator says in the first trailer. And they went on to expand on this a little bit um, in Chosen Shu 1 and then in the actual movie. Right. I guess we can say Chosen Shu 1 came out before Battle of Gods did. So it's kind of this tease of information. I get the feeling that they didn't want to divulge too much, which is really weird because you think of it as a reference book, but they did have to be cognizant of the fact that the movie was not out yet. So they couldn't just spoil the whole thing. Yeah. Although what's funny is that they, in some ways, they gave more information than they ultimately gave in the actual movie. Yeah, yeah, they did. Like, well, I guess we can get into that later. Or should sure. we just start into that right now? You want to start there? Well, I mean, we're, we're pre-movie, so I guess let's start there, yeah. Well, so this was the interesting thing. So Chosen Shu 1 came out, what, three months before the movie debuted? Yeah, I already forgot. There's a website that can I tell you. Because they came out, each Chosen Shu volume, they were like, it was like one a month, and the last one came out slightly after the movie's debut, so something like that. Anyway, so Chosen Shu 1 has this t- these two pages devoted to going into the quote-unquote ever-expanding world of the gods. And so it looks at the uh, god of destruction Beerus and his attendant Wiss and just what the heck they're doing. And then it explains about them in contrast to the gods of creation who we know as the Kaios and Kaioshins. Right, which uh, never heard anything like that before. Yeah, that's the thing. So prior to this, I mean, the god system in Dragon Ball, it's been based on areas, basically, instead of like being a god of a thing. Right, right. You know, so Kaio, of course, he's the god of the North Galaxy. The god of Earth is the god of Earth. Um, Kaio Shin, it gets a little fuzzy, but he's supposed to be like the god of the Kaios. So mm-hmm. he's like in charge of both the living world and the afterlife, as they explain in some of the Daizenshu. Mm-hmm. And so all of these people, uh, they're just supposed to be watching over different z- regions of the universe or things like that. And so it's kind of weird to suddenly be told in uh, this in Battle of Gods and in Chosen Shu 1 that actually these guys are, in addition to all that, they're the gods of creation. You know, if you want to take a step back, in between the series and the Daizenshu explanations, we did have super exciting guide stuff that added a little bit with the Shinjin and the golden fruit, all that kind of stuff. But that's still... Even there, that expansion didn't get into this whole creation realm. So, so we had new information. If you remember at the time, I know Heath and I were very, very heavy. We were convinced that Whis was going to be a Makayoshin. And it didn't end up going in that direction. So we got all that information that they, as far as we can tell, have not done anything with. And then they went in this other direction and still didn't do a whole lot with the creation. Yeah. So, well, Toriyama says in the Chosen Shu 1 interview that the Kaios and Kaioshin, they... They have the power of creation, or more specifically, they, quote, provide the stimulus for new planets and new life forms to be born. And he also says, like, sometimes they might split up an existing planet into several smaller planets or Hmm. move the life forms from one planet to another planet and weird stuff like that. But he then goes on to say that what they mainly do is um, just watch over these planets, which is the role we've seen in the actual series. Sure. I mean, the primary, I guess, job of every god that we see in the series is they pretty much just sit and watch. They just kind of watch and wait for basically the heroes to come find them and beg them for training. Right. I mean, we have a couple instances of gods doing something. The god of Earth ultimately decides maybe I should go do something about Piccolo after Create, I, creating him. Right. Yeah. <laughs> after uh, a lot of battles have gone on. Uh, we had the Kaioshin that we know in the series come down and uh, get involved somewhat with helping to attempt to prevent the resurrection of Majin Buu. But overall, they just kind of hang out and look in crystal balls. Yeah, because Toriyama does say, uh, again, in Chosen Shu 1, they, that these all these gods, they maintain a neutral standpoint. Mm. So they only get involved if the, a crisis threatens to uh, disrupt the balance. Or, or threaten them. <laughs> yeah, well, both. <laughs> right. They probably view that as the same thing, really. Sure, sure. Okay. But, so there's, there's this word again. They keep saying balance this, balance that. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, that's the important thing. To balance out the gods of creation, we've got the gods of destruction. And so basically the system we have here, as explained in Chosen Shu 1, is that the gods of destruction exist as a kind of checkpoint on planetary overpopulation. Mm. So over in one corner, we've got uh, Kaioshin just making planets willy-nilly. And then in order to keep the universe from getting too crowded, we've got 
that? Well, in our seventh universe, we've got Beerus blowing up planets every now and then just to keep things from getting out of hand. And maybe this is jumping a little bit ahead in uh, our outline here, but I think it kind of ties in. Uh, Beerus was planning on destroying the science. I mean, there's he, he's got this idea of, all right, I'm going to take care of this race over here. Um, Toriyama clarifies that the gods of destruction, they don't take orders from the gods of creation. So as we we see this pretty clearly in the movie, that Kaioshin doesn't order Beerus around. He just does whatever the heck he wants. Mm -hmm. And so we don't really know what the other gods of destruction are like, but as far as Beerus is concerned, he's very uh, finicky. And so he just destroy things if he feels like it. Right, you piss him off and, all right, I can take care of you. This is my job, I'll just do it. Yeah, he doesn't have some sort of master plan for what planets he's going to destroy. And so he might even, Toriyama's, says destroy an important planet if he feels like it Hmm. which may be a reference to the fact that he's supposed to have blown up north kaio's planet (laughs) when he got mad but i don't know anyway barris he just goes around destroying things and um for him at least like he says they say he sleeps for decades on end and then wakes up and just for a few days it seems to go around destroying stuff and no one can stop him Right. And the Kaioshin, they can they can only stand by and watch. And this is kind of where the movie starts is just uh, them. The Kaioshin is talking with North Kaio about Beerus waking up and Goku wants to know what's happening. And the rest is history. That takes us to the movie, I guess. Where do you want to go from here? Do you want to talk about some of the new stuff we learn in the movie? Or is there more about Beerus and Whis that we can get into? Well, I guess the first thing I want to point out is that in the movie, they actually, okay, Kaio, he takes Goku aside. They drive around his planet and he explains, he gives a kind of brief rundown about this. But the important thing is, is he, he says that they need the both the gods of destruction and creation to maintain balance but he doesn't actually give the reason why we need destruction which as i said in chosen shu one it's kind of to prevent overpopulation more or less Mm -hmm. can't can't keep too many planets like gotta keep them in check and so but he doesn't say this in the movie it's just he just says we need them to maintain balance he doesn't say why why okay and it's a little weird like maybe it got cut maybe it was in an earlier draft of the movie because we know right, that right. the movie went through several drafts sure sure that in fact it could have been recorded and was in there and just cutting time with him driving around i just wanted to get to get to some more stuff there so yes yeah, so possible uh, it's interesting how that affects the movie though because uh i mean throughout the whole movie they may it's very important that everyone just assumes beerus has the right to destroy whatever he wants like even goku's like well you know i know it's your job but just spare us this one time Hmm. No one ever really questions his right. And it's interesting because in the movie itself, they don't give a reason for why he ought to have that right. Well, do you think that's necessary? I mean, you can kind of watch it and does it really matter? Yeah, that's the thing. I, I don't know. But I guess what I find interesting is that in this case, it's extra background information that we got before the movie itself came out. Sure. Okay. So maybe they were just counting on people buying Chosen Shu 1 and just it's knowing possible. this in advance. So who knows? I mean, we are talking what has been added to the world here through all of the various Battle of Gods stuff. So it applies. So I guess um, t- now moving on from Gods of Destruction in general to uh, Beerus in particular. So not to get too ahead of ourselves, but Beerus is the God of Destruction for the seventh universe. Yeah, I mean, we learned this pretty much at the very end of the movie, but if, to set the stage for everything else, it's important. Tosses that in there. But so the seventh universe is essentially just where Dragon Ball is set. Right. Everything we've seen up into this point is within the confines of the seventh universe. Well, here's a question, More or less. and you, you probably can't answer it. Yeah. But what about alternate timelines? Are those a different universe or are those alternate timelines of the seventh universe within the seventh universe? Well, to the... To the extent that Chosen Shu 4 clarifies this at all, it seems like they'd just be alternate timelines for the seventh universe. Just within it, contained within it. Yeah. Like the eighth universe would have its own alternate timelines. Presumably, if they've got okay. time machines over there. Uh, well, right. Okay. So, well, you know, like with uh, the timelines we see in the series, there's different Earths. You know, there's the Earth where, quote unquote, future trunks comes from with 17 and 18 running around. There's the Earth right, right. from main timeline. These yeah, are, that's what I mean. These are different Earths, but it's not like they're, um, you know, they're not different planets per se. They're different timeline versions of the same planet. Sure, And sure. by extension, we've got different timeline versions of the same universe. Anyway, so... Um, the upshot of this is that as far as we know right now, and this could change if Toriyama ever adds anything more to this, but while in the seventh universe, we've got all of these Kaios and Kaioshins, like 10 all together, 
all, we've got all those guys on one side, and then on the other side, we've only got Beerus. It's one god of destruction in contrast to all the other gods of creation, which I guess makes sense since Beerus is way, way, way stronger than everybody else, but still, seems like he's pulling a larger workload than the rest. Now, here's a question that a lot of people were presuming before they actually got the chance to see the movie itself. The question is, is there an equivalent of Beerus in every universe? And we don't know for sure, because all he says is he's the god of destruction for the seventh universe, and that there are a total of 12 universes. Right. He doesn't specifically say there were 12 gods of destruction. He yeah. says he's the god of destruction here. By the way, there are these other universes. So it's possible that in the other universes, maybe some universes have more than one god of destruction. Maybe some don't have any for whatever reason. So we don't know if the grand total comes out to 12. Might be more, might be less, but I don't know. It's probably safe to assume it's 12, but we don't want to jump to conclusions. And so with uh, Beerus, he's assisted by Wiss, who's his, he described as his attendant. And he's called this in the movie. He's uh, listed as this in the um, god hierarchy charts that they have in Chosenshu 1 and 4. Mm -hmm. And so this is a kind of very similar to how Mr. Popo is described in in reference to the god of Earth. Right. And Kibito to the Kaioshin that we see in the series, yeah. too. And so that's this is actually where Kibito gets his name from. In Japanese, attendant is Sukibito, and so he just gets his name from that through a, a relatively direct name pun as far as <laughs> Dragon Ball is concerned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You guys, Toriyama was just lazy that day, especially lazy. Some of these other attendants, I mean, Mr. Popo in particular, did take on a, a training role. But Whis, we know, is very specifically Beerus's martial arts instructor. Yes, so in addition to his attendant, he reveals at the end of the movie, Beerus reveals at the end of the movie that besides being his attendant, Wiss is his martial arts master, and therefore implicitly stronger than him. As right. we sort of see at the end where he like karate chops him to sleep. Right, right. And then we get that uh, 6, 10, 15. <laughs> yeah. Numerical thing from Toriyama. Also, um, Wiss takes it upon himself towards the end of the movie to... Uh, recruit Goku. He asks Goku, like, once Beerus dies, would you like to come and be the new god of destruction? Well, that's interesting because is Beerus going to die soon? I mean, is <laughs> I Goku going to live forever? We don't think so. I mean, I don't know. He, Beerus is looking kind of old, but I don't I know. I suppose. <laughs> Weird. Uh, maybe ties into GT where Goku is apparently immortal, but who knows? Right. Sure. Anyway, so it's interesting, though, because this implies that Whis just kind of sticks around for different generations of gods of destruction for the seventh universe. Now, here's something I totally don't remember. Was Mr. Popo the attendant to a former god of Earth? Yeah, he was. Um, Goku says, I think it's the Saiyan arc, he reveals that Popo was actually got the attendant to the god of Earth before the current god of Earth. Okay, I thought so, yeah. And then also the god before that and before that, and he kind of trails off. Gotcha. So Whis is playing a similar role here. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting also that the gods of destruction are apparently just recruited from the regular inhabitants of the universe. I mean, that's not too different. Our, our god of Earth is a Namekian. Well, yeah, it's very, very, it seems directly equivalent to the system they've got set up with the gods of each planet. Like, yeah. we're told in the series, you know, you, a lot of people have trouble with this idea. They think, well, uh, if they're God, they have to be born God or something like that. But in Dragon Ball, it's usually pretty much just a job. And so, like on each planet, they're, they go into this a little more in detail in Dai Zenshu 7 and then later Chozenshu 4. But in the series itself, the uh, God of Earth we first see, uh, you know, Mr. You know, the green old guy, you may know as Kami, uh, right. He tells Goku that uh, long ago he was a talented martial artist, very similar to Goku, and he just found his way up to the temple in the sky. And the god of Earth at the time eventually made him his successor. And so it's passed, the job is passed down along in that way amongst the inhabitants of Earth. And it, by a wacky coincidence, though, Earth keeps ending up with Namekians for God. But it's not <laughs> supposed at least to be like, yeah. Just like you were saying, a lot of people have trouble coming from the monotheistic god idea. I mean, a lot of what Dragon ball is pulling from isn't it just the the buddhist bureaucratic god system uh, i mean we see a lot of that in journey to the west where we have all these gods they have jobs they have attendants they have roles they can be sent down and punished and they can die yeah i mean that's in journey to the west we see this especially with uh soon wukong himself who is very briefly appointed like the divine stable boy <laughs> exactly and when he learns 
mentions that he's such an unimportant god, he gets furious and starts beating up on the other gods and the rest. Right. Of I mean, he's he's essentially a god at that point. It's just that as a god, his job is to clean up the horse poop. Okay, so we know for a fact, like with each it's explained in guidebooks a bit. It's like for each planet, they're supposed to appoint like the best person on that planet, more or less, to be the god. <laughs> right. And in practice, it kind of works. It breaks down. But in theory, that's how it's supposed to work. And so it seems, as near as we can tell from Wiss's comment at the end of the movie, that the post of God of Destruction works in similar in a similar way, where apparently whoever Wiss sees who he's impressed by is like, oh, you, you're the new God of Destruction. Mm. Yeah, it's up to the attendant. Okay. And I guess on a similar note, um, I think it's chosen issue one, but somewhere or another in the supplemental material, they specify that Beerus and Wiss's little uh, pyramid planet they live on, it's located within the actual, um, the universe, the living world, rather than the afterlife where gods like Kaio and the Kaioshin live. Hmm, okay. So in, that's another way he's similar to the gods of each planet, because obviously the gods of each planet, they live on that planet. And so... Well, I mean, he's got an important job. He wants to live near his work, so he's yeah. going to live in the same realm. He doesn't want to commute. Right, exactly. <laughs> Even though we can see via Weiss that they can commute pretty quickly. Anyway, so moving away from like Beerus and his, tight, his post as God of Destruction, I guess we're getting into the little bits of history they throw out between Beerus and Frieza and the science. And this is it feels like a heavily condensed version of what was in the original scripts here. Uh, some of it is left in. As I was watching the movie, knowing so much, I mean, the whole bunch of us, we went in knowing too much to Battle of Gods. It was very different from, I think, some of the more casual viewers. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. It was just very different for us. Watching it, I felt knowing that I was only getting kind of half the story here with Frieza and King Vegeta, all that stuff. Did you feel the same way? A little bit, although I guess you're referring to the um, original original idea for Beerus to have infected the signs with evil and stuff yeah, like exactly, that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I did. I am really glad they didn't go with that idea. But at the same time, I just think that'd be a terrible idea. But at the same time, I it does feel a little like the stuff we got is a little just there for the sake of being there. Yeah, just reminiscent of these earlier ideas. And well, we let's tie it in sort of, I guess. I mean, that, that opening scene where Beerus, he wakes up and then Whis kind of explain, gives him the rundown of Frieza What's and happened? Goku. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, it feels like a very, just a way of summarizing the series for anyone who maybe isn't too familiar with Dragon Ball. Oh, totally. It, it was very obvious exposition yeah. to get you up to speed. I mean, that's Dragon Ball in like one minute. It's like, here, here's Goku. <laughs> he turns Super Saiyan. He beats Frieza, blah, blah, blah. Here we go. They yeah. all live on Earth now. They're a happy family, more or less. But Okay, so let, let's get yeah. to some of this stuff. Uh, so instead of of infecting the scions, well, he visits them. Yeah, so it seems to be a habit established um, in comments like this that Beerus will just kind of drop in on places and more or less have people keep him entertained in exchange for not blowing the place up. Yeah, yeah. So is it that he was planning on blowing it up and if they entertain him, maybe he won't? It almost feels like, you even said yourself, he doesn't really have a grand plan. He just kind of makes these decisions. Yeah, so they don't entirely explain it in the movie, but uh, when Vegeta first sees Beerus, he remembers suddenly that they've met yeah, before. Yeah. So we see in flashback that when Vegeta was a little boy, Beerus came to the planet and King Vegeta had to give him food and what is uh, Beerus use him as like a stepping stool or something like mm-hmm. that. And so this left a slightly traumatic memory for a, a little <laughs> Prince Vegeta. Right. And then, but, uh, and we get that flashback. It's never quite explained what went on there. It's, it's just, we see it, but it's not explained in dialogue. Yep. Uh, but so earlier though, at the start of the movie, Beerus, uh, once he wakes up, he asks Wiss if, uh, Frieza destroyed planet Vegeta. And Wiss is like, yeah, it's gone now. And so Beerus kind of, he explains that, you know, the Saiyans were really bad guys. So he thought he'd destroy them. But planet Vegeta was so far away that he decided to just have Frieza do it instead. And then he says, like, but Frieza's a bad guy too, so I think this time I'll go destroy Frieza. Yeah, yeah, that's the crucial thing I want to pull out there is because we're we're setting it up, this whole movie, that Beerus is the villain. But we've had a lot of discussions about this. Is he a villain if he's just doing his job? So here Beerus is talking about, well, these guys are bad, so I'm going to go destroy them. So is he a good guy because he wants to do that? Or is he just selecting them, trying to be neutral about it? It's tough to pin him down there. Yeah, I mean, maybe by bad, he just means he doesn't like them mm, yeah sure uh, anyway so he says that he and since the planet was so far away he had frieza destroyed instead which is 
A, a little strange because we see later on that he has been to Planet Vegeta. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's when he learned it was so far away he didn't want to go back. Yeah, that's true. Know. Right. But they seem to be able to get anywhere they want in like 10 minutes flat. So, <laughs> right. I don't know. Maybe Whis was, you know, off doing something else at the moment and he would have had to have traveled himself. But, we don't. I mean, I guess the point is he's really lazy. Yeah. Yeah. He's, I mean, that's just the cat there. He's an omnipotent Garfield, basically. That's right. Anyway, so... Uh, he then says that he had Frieza do it instead, which is interesting because it kind of implies that the reason Frieza destroyed planet Vegeta was not, as we were previously told, because he was afraid of the super science or afraid of all the science teaming up against him or stuff like that, but rather just because Beerus asked him to. Well, that that's the question here. Is it that Beerus knew Frieza and asked him to destroy it, or was it that... Beerus knew that Frieza would destroy it and so just happened to let him destroy it. Yeah, I mean, it's open to interpretation. And certainly it, it would uh, save a lot of plot holes if we just assumed he knew Frieza was going to destroy it on his own. Yeah, that that's how I kind of interpreted it, but... You know, because I want to be clear here. I mean, otherwise, the entire plot of like the Namek storyline is, uh, you know, retconned, which is kind of inconvenient. <laughs> right, right. We don't want to get too deep. Toriyama doesn't want to get too deep in there. There was a recent thing that Julian translated. I'll be putting up, but Tori, someone asked Toriyama a question about something, and he goes, "Uh, maybe it's better off that I don't answer that, <laughs> so I don't get myself in trouble here." I love that man. <laughs> it's great. Sometimes he knows that you know what? Maybe I should just stop. All right. So we've learned that there are these gods of creation there are at least one god of destruction this god of destruction has met the science before and may or may not have been involved with the destruction of this race so now we're kind of turning things over to what you think is the main point of the movie and that's super saiyan gods the other god in the title kami to kami god and god this is a lot more added <laughs> to the dragon ball universe here yeah so Beerus uh, wakes up and he says that in his dream, he was fighting a guy, a thing called Super Saiyan God. And it takes him a while to remember the full details. But once he hears from Whis that a uh, that Frieza has been defeated by a Saiyan, uh, he decides here, go to Earth and, you know, here check out the remaining Saiyans and see if they know anything about Super Saiyan God. And of course, they all know about regular Super Saiyan, but nobody's heard of Super Saiyan God. Not even Vegeta or Kai or any of the people who usually know what's up. And so eventually they just get Shenlong to answer for them, <laughs> which is odd, I guess. Well, I guess Shenlong, you know, he's supposed to grant wishes. So whatever you ask him, he'd have to magically know the answer to. I suppose the wish would be in that case. But I mean, we see Shenlong kind of deferring to the might that is Beerus there in a I mean, Shenlong kind of exists outside this god hierarchy, but he's kind of tossed in at the same time because he's this godly creation i suppose he's like god's sock puppet yeah who happens to know everything yeah he is called the god of the dragons in the first chapter and then never again but right who knows how that's supposed to work because we don't even see other dragons we've just got him well jay jay Purunga is the god of love oh uh, that's true all, all right, right moving on Okay, so uh, when asked, Shenlong divulges the whole story behind Super Saiyan God. And so he says that long ago on planet Vegeta, the few righteous Saiyans accidentally created an artificial god called Super Saiyan God. So this thing, it was the god of the Saiyans, and the um, it tried to defeat the evil Saiyans who made up most of the planet's population. But because the Super Saiyan God transformation had a time limit, this uh, previous Super Saiyan God, he transformed back before he could get the job done, and then he was defeated. Pretty similar to Gotenks overall. Yeah, yeah. And so a as a result, he and the other righteous Saiyans, they were all defeated, and the uh, Super Saiyan God was, quote, erased from legend, end quote. Well, that's where I want to go here, because if none of the Saiyans remember this, I mean, the final Saiyans we see are really Vegeta and any of his cohorts. So if we were to assume that anyone who's alive at Vegeta's time has no memory, recollection, written history, oral history of Super Saiyan God, it had to have been a long ass time ago. Yeah, and that's kind of where you run into trouble if you want to tie in the other anime stuff into the same continuity as Battle of Gods, because of course in a GT and the earlier OVA stuff, we it's established right. that the signs are not from Planet Vegeta, but from some other place which may or may not be called uh, planet saya and if you <laughs> want to go by the um 
Daizenshu 7 and then the Chozenshu 4 chronology, they've only been on planet Vegeta for roughly 400 years by the time they wipe out the Sifruians. Mm -hmm. And so in that rather cramped time frame, it's a little hard to place these events. So we've got Plan to Eradicate the Super Saiyans, GT, Episode of Bardock, Battle of Gods, all fighting for what was the uh, original history of the science here, where, when, how. But still, if you just want to ignore all the uh, Sifruian stuff and the science coming from other planets, then I guess it's pretty easy to say that, yeah, this could be billions, thousands, million, who knows, how many years in the past on planet Vegeta that they created this super Saiyan god. Right, I mean, like Jocko does not specifically contradict anything by the actual pencil of Toriyama himself in the manga, Battle of Gods... Other than, I mean, we talked about a couple little contradictions, mostly just ages of, what, just Bulma more yeah. than anything else, does not necessarily contradict anything by the pencil of Toriyama in the manga itself. But the other, the other interesting thing is that they say, Shenlong says that the Super Saiyan God was erased from legend, which almost makes it seem like rather than being the legendary Super Saiyan, it's the exact opposite of legendary. <laughs> right. Nobody's heard of it. And now, does this infer that it was purposefully erased from legend? Like, was there a cover-up by the evil science to help prevent any further righteous science from emerging? I mean, we don't really know for sure. They don't go into that detail. But, I mean, that's what it sounds like. Because it says they were all defeated and it was erased from legend. So Yeah, I guess if it was just naturally lost, it would be something like lost to a legend or something like lost to time. Know. Well, it's like the victor. History is written by the winners. Right, exactly. So we could go on for uh, God knows how long just trying to figure out where Super Saiyan God is supposed to be in relation to the previously mentioned Legend of the Super Saiyan. But, <laughs> that's not. Yeah, let, that's another topic for another day. All right. So we've got this <laughs> new history of the Saiyans and Super Saiyan God, this concept of righteous Saiyans pouring their, their light, their energy, their righteous energy into another Saiyan erased from history. Here we are in current history, Goku. Yeah. So once they uh, work out the conditions for obtaining Super Saiyan God, which uh, per Shenlong's instruction is that you got to get five uh, righteous hearted Saiyans to pour their light into a six for some reason. Like once you hit the, if it's five, then it's no good. Once you hit six, that's the magic number. And they're well, we saw that in practice in the movie itself. Yeah, yeah. And this is a really curious detail, but I don't know. For whatever reason, you need a full Pokemon team to a obtain Super <laughs> Saiyan God. Well, the, the reason they're doing this was to have a twist there. I mean, I'm sure that's the only reason why the number is what it is. I mean, yeah. I mean, Toriyama said, I think it's the anime comic version of the movie. Toriyama has an interview where he very flat out says that they came up with the number six just to fit the storyline. Anyway, so uh, Goku, he gets um, Vegeta, Trunks, Gohan, Goten, and then Pan, who isn't even Pan yet. She's just <laughs> inside Videl there. Yep. And they all give him their light and he very suddenly, he gets red hair, he gets skinnier, looks a bit younger, and he's got a fiery aura. He's got like mystical god energy that no one else can even tell how powerful he is. Which I guess we kind of glossed over with Beerus. Um, like, they make a point of saying that Goku can't sense Beerus, and Apparently nobody else other than other gods can. It's just a, a different kind of key. Yeah, it's pretty much the same thing as with the androids, but with gods instead of androids. Yeah, sure, sure. Anyway, so when Goku is in Super Saiyan God mode, he gets that same uh, high quality key is what they call it. Whatever that means. Anyway, so he gets, you know, a lot more powerful, fights Beerus, loses. Beerus wasn't even using 70% of his power. But better luck next time. However, during the course of the fight, Goku's time limit runs out. Like they mentioned, it's kind of same as with Fusion. It's got that time limit there. Yeah. But instead of reverting back to normal, he well, he he becomes. He does. I, I mean, he becomes a regular regular old Goku again, and then he transforms into a regular Super Saiyan, but he's still much, much more powerful. And so before, like we saw when Goku fights Beerus the first time, he becomes Super Saiyan 3 and he's defeated in two blows. But this time he's managing to, he's clearly at a disadvantage, but he's still holding his own as just a regular Super Saiyan. Mm -hmm. And so Beerus, uh, he eventually tells Goku this because Goku hasn't even noticed that he's <laughs> right. transformed like, by back. The way, have you noticed yeah. or not? It's like the, what is it, Wily e. Coyote going over the cliff. <laughs> exactly. Doesn't look yep. down. But so he says that Goku has absorbed the uh, power of the Super Saiyan God into his body. And therefore, because even though he's 
transformed back, he still hasn't significantly powered down. And so Beer says this is all because Goku is such a fighting genius. And then later on, during the like the very end of the fight, Goku's trying to block back Beerus' huge energy ball, and so he briefly transforms back into Super Saiyan God on his own, and then transforms back. And even Beerus has no clue how he did that. And Goku doesn't know either, and so... This is all somewhat confusing, to say the least, but uh, Toriyama has said in the anime comics interview that Goku now permanently has the power of Super Saiyan God, and so he doesn't need to go through that whole rigmarole of having the other five guys give him their energy again. At the end, then, Vegeta also said he's, he wants to be the one to become Super Saiyan God next time. You can read this in a couple different ways. The most easiest way is simply Vegeta chasing after Goku, as he's always done, where Goku is Super Saiyan first, and he's like, oh, I'm going to become Super Saiyan. Or you can read this as, okay, this means that there can be more than one Super Saiyan God. And then the question is, can Goku contribute to Vegeta becoming Super Saiyan God? Or do you need now six non-Super Saiyan gods to help contribute? In which case, I suppose he could go get Tarble and grab everyone else but Goku. Or they could wait till uh, Bra is born. No, that's true. That's true. But maybe she's not pure hearted. That's true. Does she need to be? Well, yeah. She just needs to be righteous. Yeah, whatever that. Well, they kind of mix. They're a little vague over what exactly is there a difference between righteous and pure hearted. Because I think they actually say like, um, they say, I think Piccolo says like, ah, we've only got Gohan pure hearted here. (laughs) Oh, right. That's right. Vegeta's Vegeta and Goku, they're right out. And, um, even Trunks, he's got a girlfriend got a now, girlfriend now so yeah. therefore he's impure. It's very prudish these days, Piccolo. I mean, Gohan's married, yeah, so... A, I think it was Penguin Truth who said this on the forums, but just to quote him, why does Goku need to train Oob at this point? That's <laughs> true. Well, we've seen Goku, even though he's the strongest, like when we, we don't know, but he knows he has Super Saiyan 3. He, he still wants to pass it down to the kids because he wants a future successor because he's not always going to be there. But still... Good point. Yeah, just throw that out there. But anyway, All right. so next up. This kind of ties back around to what we were talking about much earlier in our discussion here, where we revealed early on, as opposed to the movie, which reveals it at the end, that Beerus is the god of destruction of the seventh universe. Well, I guess that means there's multiple universes. Yeah. So at the end there, you know, Goku, he loses to Beerus and Beerus says, you did a great job. You're the second strongest person I've ever fought. Which annoys Go- Goku. Well, he's taken aback at this. And so it turns out that Whis is implicitly the strongest guy Beerus ever fought. But then Beerus adds, he says, I'm the god of destruction for the seventh universe. And there's 12 universes in total. So there may be even more incredible guys out there. Which is exactly what Goku wants to hear. Okay, so yeah, this is expanding the horizons of the series. Basically saying, like, everything we've seen up until this point, it's just one out of 12. <laughs> as near as we can tell. So we can do the entire Dragon Ball franchise 11 months more times pretty much and maybe that's their plan but who knows anyway so of course this does kind of raise questions about what form these other universes take because the funny thing is is that prior to this the word universe in dragon ball actually only really referred to a rather small part of the overall dragon ball world so we had basically i guess what you could call the living world which as you might assume is where all the living people live Right. And so this is divided into two halves, one half of which is the universe. And so this is <laughs> this is where Goku and this is where Earth is. Goku lives there. This is the thing. It's divided up into the four galaxies, north, south, east, west. And then opposite all that stuff, like on the flip side of a coin, is the demon world where Dabra hangs out. Right. And then these two parts together, they make up the living world. And opposite them is the afterlife where all the dead people don't live. Right, and the afterlife is for both the living realm and the demon realm, yeah, right? As we see when Dabra dies and he goes to the afterlife and it turns right. it turns out that um the demon world is similar to hell, which is why Enma's like, "Well, I'm not going to send him to hell because he'd like it there. I'm going to send him to heaven." And so they're similar places, hell and the demon world, but they're one of them is in the living world and then one of them is in the afterlife. And so it's it's kind of confusing, but there you go. And right. so besides hell in the uh, in the afterlife, we've got heaven, of course. We've got Kai, the planet for each of the four Kaios. And then we've on top of that, above heaven, we've got the Dai Kaios planet. And there might and there's various other things. And then out so all of these things together, the living world, the afterlife, they are set inside this giant snow globe, more or less. Right. 
Now, here's where I think you're heading with this. They're set outside the the living realm, all that stuff. Are they set outside the universe? And does that instead mean that, like, I don't even know where to go with that because that's yeah. so confusing. Yeah, okay. So, okay, we've got the giant snow globe. Half of it's the living world. Half of it's the world of the dead. And then uh, we already knew outside of all this is actually the Kaioshin realm where the Kaioshin will live because they're just so special and they need their own separate cosmos. Yeah, and it, it revolves around the other war, other cosmos like a moon. It's kind of confusing, and so inside their cosmos, they've got the their planet, and then the other planets and moons and suns all for themselves. Because mm-hmm. really, you know that planet we actually see them stand on, you know where the Z sword is. Yeah, yeah, where they fight Boo. That's just one thing inside their realm, and then there's all those other things you can see in the sky. Right, right, of course. And so they've got you know it's they're their own private property, but okay, so. <laughs> And the reason we have this, this kind of weird setup, rather prosaically, is that, you know, Toriyama, he first came up with this diagram of the DB cosmos for the afterlife tournament filler arc. Because they were asking him, like, you know, how's all heaven and hell relate to Earth? Like, how is this stuff situated? Right. Is they got that draw? They have to transfer people between these places. Like, what do we do? Yeah. So Toriyama, he drew this thing up really quickly. He drew up the snow globe that I kind of described briefly. And you actually do see this very briefly in the Afterlife Tournament. And then I think you see Dai Kaio, like, really giant, bouncing it on his finger like it's a basketball. Mm-hmm. And then still, like, at this point... Toriyama hadn't come up with the Kaioshin yet. And so he came up with that thing. And then for the Daizenshu, after the series ended, he realized, oh, yeah, I've got to include where the Kaioshin live. Just throw it outside all that. Yeah, it's it's a, that's why they have their own universe. That's the real reason. But ostensibly, it's so they can watch over everyone else. Sure. Anyway, so bringing us to Battle of Gods, the question is, when they say there are uh, 12 different universes, do they mean that the, there's like 12 different uh, subdivisions of the universe that's inside the snow globe we already know about? Or are there 11 other snow globes with their own <laughs> like other sets of gods? And so it's still not 100% clear, not as much as I'd like, uh, from Chozenshu 4. But basically, Chozenshu 4 makes it seem like there's 12, I mean, there's 11 other snow globes. Well, okay, so Chozenshu 4, it's an updated version of Daizenshu 7, and so it's got an updated version of the section at the beginning of Daizenshu 7 that kind of goes over everything I just tried to explain, where it's like, you know, heaven's here, earth is here, blah, blah, blah. And so it mentions that all of this stuff makes up a giant sphere. And then it says that this sphere is the seventh of 12. Mm, okay. And I probably should have written down the exact quote, but... <laughs> No, that's all right. Yeah, that's I mean, enough. <laughs> that's the, the, the takeaway is that it sounds like there's 12 other spheres. That's a pretty heavy implication there. I mean, I would have really liked Toriyama to draw like 12, the 12 of them in like some kind of configuration or something, but maybe next time. Anyway, so there we go. And so I guess I should emphasize. Okay, so as soon as uh, word got out that the movie said there were more than one universes, a lot of fans kind of naturally tied this into the setup they have in the fan comic Dragon Ball Multiverse. Right. Which is more of a, what we were talking about earlier, it's more of a parallel timeline kind of different universes. Like the setup of uh, DB Multiverse is that there's a big tournament going on between different kind of alternate universes of Dragon Ball. And Mm -hmm. so one universe is the one we know from the main series. Another one is one where, for whatever reason, Vegito never split up back into Goku and Vegito, so he's still around. Another universe is one where it's uh, like the Saiyans, they're still primitive. You know, they're still like cave people living on planet Vegeta. Right. And so forth and so on. I think one is where the main cast is all women, stuff like that. Anyway, so it's that kind of alternate timelines where each different universe basically has alternate versions of Goku and the rest of the cast. And so this is what's happening in uh, Dragon Ball Multiverse. And a lot of people assumed that this was what they were implying in Battle of the Gods when Beerus says there's 12 universes. However, I mean, for one thing, in the actual movie itself, Self. Beers makes pretty clear that, you know, uh, the universe, the seventh universe is just everything we've seen in Dragon Ball so far. And then the other universes are outside that. He, uh, who knows what kind of strong enemies might be out there in the other universes, which wouldn't really make sense for him to say that if the other universes just contain alternate versions of himself and Goku. Mm, I see what you mean. So it's like, oh, and there's just Frieza stuck around so you can go fight Frieza over there. He sounds like he doesn't know. <laughs> it, it's totally different. Yeah. 
Of course, you could say you could flip that around and say, well, if he doesn't know, then he can't know what they're like by definition. But <laughs> right. Where's the burden of proof here? Yeah. Anyway, but still in Chosen Shu 4 and I think one, two, they say that Dragon Ball is set in the seventh universe. Like they say it's the setting of Dragon Ball. They say Dragon Ball is where Goku lives. They say the seventh universe is where Majin Buu and Frieza have. OK. And so all of this obviously makes it sound like presumably the other universes wouldn't be where alternate versions of Dragon Ball are set. Just totally different. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I feel like we get enough of that confirmation in the movie itself, but if you need further confirmation, Chosen Shu's got you covered. But still, I mean, we don't actually know anything about the other universes, so all of this could technically turn out to be wrong until they feel like revealing more information about them. So we're at the point where we're, we kind of started small and got bigger and bigger. We're at the universe here, multiple universes. Let's pull it way the heck back to a, a very <laughs> easy to understand our world. And when I say our world, I mean the Dragon Ball world that we saw in the series. Battle of Gods adds to that. The next section you have here is chronology. We get more dates and times and specific pinpoints of events here. Yay, my favorite part. But Great. we don't get too well. Okay, so ob we went into this a little bit when you talked about the JSAT special. Yeah, yeah. But the JSAT special, it's set approximately two years after the Majin Buu saga, which places it roughly in age 776. The Chosen Shu 4 timeline, you know, it's it's an updated version of the Dyson Shu 7 timeline, which is the first thing that really went through and gave hyper exact dates to all the stuff that happens throughout the series. Yeah, yeah. Like saying, oh, Raditz arrives on October 31st, age 761, which is a great trivia question. But so, um, so Chosen Shu 4, it takes that timeline and just adds in stuff from GT, from the JSAT special, Battle of Gods, some other stuff. And so it gives the date of Battle of Gods as age 778. So four years after the Buu Saga, about two years after the JSAT special, one year more or less before Pan is born, and then five years, or no, sorry, six years before the end of the manga with Goku meeting Ub. I mean, it's fairly logical enough because we know, obviously, Pan is, uh, four, she's said to be four in the, at the end of the series. And then based on her birth date, her birth year given in the guidebooks, she's technically four going on five. And so going off of that, she should turn five years old at some later point in that same year. Yeah. Anyway, so obviously if she's conceived by the time Battle of the Gods takes place, then Battle of the Gods must be less than nine months before her birth, unless science have some kind of wacky conception to birth time. Right. Anyway, but so Battle of the Gods kind of just, I mean, the Chosen Shu 4 timeline takes the easy route and just assumes it's going to be roughly nine months before she's born as Battle of Gods, which technically puts it in the prior calendar year. So, Got it. Simple version, Bu Busaga 774, JSET Special 776, Battle of Gods 778, Pan born 779, End of the Manga 784. But this is a little important. One thing to note here is that the movie pretty definitively establishes that Pan is older than Bra. Which prior, right. prior to this was a little contentious because different sources say different things. Or actually the same source well, says I was gonna different say, things. Not really. It's the one source within itself that kind of threw it up in the air. But then we've talked about this before, I think, when we did our first topic trying to set when Battle of Gods would take place. Everything after that has gone with this other date and now even Battle of Gods seems to so it seems like that's the case yeah so I guess to clarify in the series itself they never give any age for Bra Pawn is said to be four like we said at the end of the series right and Bra's there Daisenshu 7 its timeline says that Bra is born oh god I'm gonna get this wrong aren't I uh it says she's born the year after Pawn in age 780, which would make her technically for at the end of the manga. So technically they're the same age, but at that specific point, but then Pond's going to be turning five that same year, whereas Bra won't turn five until the next year. That makes sense? Yeah. Anyway, so that's what the Dyson Shu 7 timeline says, that uh, Bra is approximately a year younger than Pan. However, Bra's bio in the Dai Zenshu 7 character dictionary says that she is born in age 778, same year that Battle of Gods is now said to be set, which would make her about a year older than Pan. However, Obviously, Bra is not around in Battle of Gods, or else they would have had a much easier time making Goku become a Super Saiyan God. Right, or they would have said, oh, she's evil. Also over 
Well, there's so many things I could have done. Right. But that wasn't even brought up. So there we go. Yes. It's like, well, we could use my baby girl, but she's pure evil. So I guess we'll have to. I don't know. <laughs> well, that could have been a good joke, too. Yeah, I, I don't mean. know. But anyway, so so Dyson 7 gives two conflicting things. The series doesn't really give any way to say which one's right. And then uh, the GT Perfect Files, the first volume, it has a kind of similar mini timeline where it just kind of goes with science Sufruian history. And it gives the birth dates for all the major signs in the series. And so it also, it gives the same date for Bra's birth as Dyson Shoe 7 timeline, which is unsurprising in that the, this timeline is pretty much just them copying the earlier timeline and adding in stuff from GT. Yeah. yeah. And then I think that's been everything until um, now when Bog, uh, <laughs> when Battle of Gods showed that Bra wasn't around by the time Pan was conceived. And so following that, Chosen Shu 4, I think it fixes uh, Bra's bio so that it says she's born in uh, 780. Ah, uh, you know, I didn't even bother to check. Uh, I forgot. <laughs> Oh, well. But the timeline, unsurprisingly, the Chozenshu 4 timeline gives 780, which is, the sa- you know, the same thing sure. as Dijon's yeah, yeah. Anyway. In terms of, all right, we got the ages for these two little girls, we think. So in terms of any other dates when things take place, all we get is when Beerus went to sleep. Yeah. And so the di- or the Chozenshu 4 timeline says that this is approximately age 739. And this actually opens up a whole can of worms because, well, okay, where they get this date from is that in the movie, Beerus is repeatedly said to have slept for 39 years. Right. Because that's when the Oracle, fi- the Oracle Fish predicted that his formidable opponent would appear in 39 years time. So it goes to yep. sleep 39 years. So they say 39 years, many, many times. So logically enough, uh, Chosen Shu 4 timeline places him going to sleep 39 years before they set Battle of the Gods taking place. 78 minus 39 gets you 39. However, the problem here is that, as we mentioned earlier, when Beerus wakes up, he asks Wiss if Frieza destroyed planet Vegeta while he was sleeping, and Wiss says yes. So they say the destruction of planet Vegeta occurred during Beerus's nap which Chosen Shu 4 says began in age 739. However, <laughs> here we go. Uh, Daizen Shu 7 timeline, as well as the Chosen Shu 4 timeline, as well as various other sources, say that Planet Vegeta was destroyed by Frieza in age 737, which is the same year Goku was born. So, in other words, this setup means that technically... The, going by this date, the planet would have been destroyed two years prior to Beerus going to sleep. All right, here, I, I have an out for you. We were talking earlier about how Beerus, he gets up and it doesn't seem like he's awake for long when he destroys things. So maybe he was asleep before he was asleep when Frieza destroyed the planet. Like he was, it was his prior nap to the snap. Yeah, something like that. I mean, he doesn't seem to be that organized. No. <laughs> but uh, the other thing to add, though, is the idea that we could say that maybe Planet Vegeta was destroyed uh, several years after Goku was born, which obviously this goes directly against the Bardock special, which shows those events occurring more or less in the same week. However, it doesn't doesn't directly contradict anything in the manga itself. Not really. And if you want to take things over to Jocko again, the one shot we do have of Goku post, I guess, Vegeta destruction, he seems to be a little older. Yeah, he seems like, I don't know, maybe at least a year old, but maybe signs are different that way for all we know. Right, right. So, Still, like, at fr- like when Raditz comes and explains to Goku the whole thing about the signs and their planet, he nothing he says specifies when the planet was destroyed. However, in the manga, we do eventually get Frieza saying something like, oh, I destroyed it 30 years ago, which is actually (laughs) too far back because Goku's like 25 at that point, but he could just be rounding up. Yeah, yeah. Still, that's the the closest thing in the manga to anything like tying the destruction of the planet to about when Goku was born. Well, and that's also just a, a good opportunity to point out that Toriyama his own words in his own manga aren't necessarily going to work with themselves in the end either. Yeah, so we could tie ourselves in knots trying to get all these dates to fit together, but, well, that's probably another 
podcast topics. Right, so. and likely will be. Oh, I should say, before we move on, did check Chosen Shu 4, and they did not correct uh, Bra's birth year in her character <laughs> dictionary bio. So it still says there, it says she's born 778, and then in the timeline, it says she's born 780. So All right, great work, guys. Curses. Oh, well. Anyway. Okay, so we'll, we'll wrap things up with uh, additional stuff that Battle of Gods has added to the Dragon World. Some of this we got before the movie came out, and some of it's just little tidbits in the movie itself. Yeah, so I think the my personal favorite, just in general, is the backstory we get for why Kaio's planet is so small. And this was actually, this was another thing that came out before the movie. It was first gone into in the uh, color manga version of the Cyan arc. For the color version, it's three volumes for all of the Cyan arc. And I think in the last volume of the Cyan arc, they had this question. Each of these new color manga volumes, they have uh, Q&As with Toriyama, and most of the time he doesn't say anything too interesting, but every now and then he lets out a real chestnut like this. And so someone asked him um, why Kaio's planet is so darn small, and he said that actually, originally, it was a lot bigger, but then one day, Beerus, the god of destruction, came visiting, and uh, he, he says that they played a racing game together, like Gran Turismo or something like that. And so right. when Beerus lost he uh, kind of got mad and blew up the entire planet. And so Kaio took one of the remaining chunks, carved it into a ball, and that's his current planet. The thing is, they mention this in the movie as well, but in the movie version, they say instead of a racing game, they say that uh, Beerus and Kaio played hide and seek, which, I don't know, to me somehow isn't quite as funny. I don't know why. Uh, they're both pretty great. Yeah, still, yeah, it's a good, it's an interesting idea. Of course, we could also go on for hours about how Kyle's planet is back in the movie. When it was, <laughs> I know, that was throwing a lot of people for a loop. Yeah, well, you know, obviously in the main series, it's destroyed by Cell when he self-destructs. And in the movie, uh, Kaio's not even dead anymore, is he? He's back to life. Or he doesn't have the halo. I can't say I remember. Oh, well. But uh, uh. It's, who knows what's going on there? Uh, he Right bought a new planet, which was somehow also destroyed by Beerus, but I don't know. Anyway, so moving on, we've got just the general fact that Pilaf, Shu, and Mai, they're all turned into kids. And this is kind of the big thing they use to, I don't want to say pad out, but it's what takes up the middle of the movie. Right. Just their wacky hijinks. And so we learn, you know, Pilaf, his lifelong ambition has been to use the Dragon Balls to take over the world but he's failed so long that now his whole gang is pretty old so he says there'd be no point in them taking over the world if they just died immediately after so they actually managed to get the dragon balls off screen and then they wish for youth instead of world domination but then shenlong kind of takes their wish too literally and he makes them little kids and so that's the form they turn up in in the movie is just these toddlers kind of right so added here is the fact that i'll peel off actually got the dragon balls and- Somehow. Here they are. They're kids now. Some day when no one was paying any attention, he got the whole set, and then who knows? Well, I mean, if the movie's any indication, there's not super tight security, so it's easy to sneak no. in anywhere and get Dragon Balls. But And I, I know that you can go from here, and if you want to get into GT, there may be a contradiction, but if Battle of Gods is any indication, anything can happen off screen, so yeah. you can easily write a right around this i mean it's you'd have a lot easier time fitting battle of gods in with gt than you would fitting battle of gods in with the actual end of the manga (laughs) i know i mean just like you know at that tournament at the end no one mentions oh by the way there was that thing six years ago where the world almost blew up and whatever and Goku became a billion times stronger, and I mean, you can make it work if you want to. I guess somewhat uh, tying into Goku getting a billion times stronger, we have what is by far, obviously, the most important thing said at any point in Battle of Gods, which Agreed. is <laughs> when <laughs> Beerus first sees Goku, he mentions in passing that it does not seem that Goku, in his regular form, could defeat Frieza. And then he says what? But apparently if you can transform into this Super Saiyan thing and get stronger that way. Anyway, this comment has been controversial among these sorts of people you'd expect it to be controversial among. But to wit, uh, you know, the battle power crowd. So anyway, the idea here is that a lot of people prior to this, they've kind of gotten, they've assumed that by the Boo arc, Goku, e- even in his regular form, is so strong that he could pro- just easily defeat Frieza, which is sort of what we see in DBZ movie 12 when Gohan takes on Frieza. 
Yeah, yeah. Also, actually, we were talking about in the JSAT special when mm-hmm. when they learn Abel and Kado are as strong as Frieza. Goku's reaction is to not even be remotely impressed. And then we see Goten and Trunks fighting these guys, you know, even without going Super Saiyan until like the very end. Anyway, so is there a contradiction here or is it like, you know, Frieza, he's got a lot of different forms, to say the least. He's There's a lot of different... W- Someone could be stronger than Frieza in one form and weaker than him in another. And, you know, who knows what form they're talking about at any given time. And also in the movie, Goku is kind of just standing there. So it's not like Beerus necessarily knows everything he's capable of without becoming Super Saiyan. So do you think there's a problem here? Well, I don't know. I don't really. It, I'm just kind of amused that it's like this throwaway comment. It's only you. It's only there to set up Beerus bringing up how Goku can become Super Saiyan. And uh, a lot of people just latch onto this as an important thing when it's not. Well, Jake, it's entirely your fault because of the strength checker well, where true. every single instance of someone noting anything about anyone's power in relation to another character is an important fact. Yes. Even if it's just them saying, oh, wow. <laughs> right. So. Or he's fast. That was my favorite. <laughs> you brought this upon yourself. Yeah, I guess. Come to. Th- yeah, and I still haven't done an equivalent thing for the movies, but. Maybe I never will. <laughs> I think it's better off if you don't. Yeah. Let's... So is this the extent of what Battle of Gods has added to the Dragon World? Mostly gods and hierarchy stuff. A little bit of Saiyan back history. A little bit more with this idea of Super Saiyan God, which was erased from legend, however. Uh, and really the biggest thing, probably the multiple universes. It's added battles and it's added gods. What more could he ask for? So where do we go from here? What else could be added? What do you expect to be added? Well, I understand that the Spanish-speaking Dragon Ball fan base has confirmed that there's going to be a (laughs) 200-episode series that delves into the other 11 gods of destruction. So I guess we've got... Got that to look forward. All right, I'm I'm super excited. Wouldn't it be great if they did have like the other gods of destruction and they're all named after some other type of alcohol? I think that would be fantastic. I am all aboard. Or maybe just different types of beverages. No, I think you gotta stick with the alcoholic beverages. But we already had someone who's a pun on vodka, didn't we? In filler somewhere. Uh, I don't remember. And there, no, wait, there's Burbone, wasn't there? Or I don't know. Or was it both? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't know these characters, man. Oh, well. It's like during the Cell, before this, in the lead up to the Cell games, they have that whole thing. Uh, oh, in there? Yeah, I don't know. It's been <laughs> years since I watched that. We should probably bring this to a close because if we go any further, we basically hit additional podcast topics. And yeah. I want to save those for future episodes. Logically enough. So before we truly wrap up, we of course have to ask that very important question. Who's that character? Jake, last time uh, you told me, I love this because sometimes I need inspiration. You had me dive back last time. This is the clip we heard. Bimbo, bimbo, bimbo. (laughs) Jake, who is this? It's Lucifer, our sweet Lucifer, from DB Movie 2, Sleeping Princess in Devil's Castle. That's right, Lucifer, as played by Nachi Nozawa. Um, Pretty sure no relation to Masako Nozawa. As far as I know. If you go back far enough, everyone's related to somebody. (laughs) That's true. So we can uh, pretty definitively say, yes, related in some fashion. Uh, So that was great. That wasn't even a trick one. That wasn't a, "Uh uh-huh, this person played this, but played this over here. That was just a uh, a great dive back to uh, a movie that doesn't get a whole lot of attention. And uh, I enjoy Dragon Ball movie too. Is that why you suggested it? Yeah, it's one of my favorites. And I figured no one would get it because it's a little, it's unjustifiably forgotten. (laughs) That's right. Erased from history. (laughs) Not entirely. Because it was the first thing the Funimation went back to. But of course, we didn't get a Japanese release for many, 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 many years. Uh, we did have a couple of people guess that though. So props to you folks. So now we have a new clip. Here is the voice, the character. Who is this character? Where do you think it's from? And one more time so you can really think, dig into your memory here. Who is this character? I don't know who it is. Jake doesn't know who it is. It's a surprise. We will find out next time here on the show. So thank you, sir. Appreciate it. 
Yep. Anytime. Kanzenshi.com. We'll see you next time. Uh, this was, what What episode was this? I don't even remember. 349. This 349. I guess 350 is a significant number. I'm looking yeah. forward to that. Uh, so that'll be next time here on the site. Uh, that's it. My name is Mike. We got Jake over there. We got Julian and Heath off in the distance. We got Mary upstairs joining us occasionally. Jake, wrap it up. Uh, well, this is the podcast again. See you some other time. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>